Hello! Welcome to Brain Spill, the laziest show on the internet. My name is Tank, and we all know NASA, the US space program who are responsible for such famous things like that time a man walked on the moon, and that other time where they did other space-related things. So uh, yeah, they're a pretty big deal. Plus, it also gives me plenty of things to do videos on, so cheers guys. However, something else you may not be aware of is the amount of money that NASA has plunged into various research projects, some of which didn't quite go to plan. In 1961, a man named John C. Lilly, a neuroscientist at the California Institute for Technology, made a book and released it called Man and Dolphin. The book pretty much goes into detail about the intelligence of dolphins and just how magnificent these creatures are, various studies, and possibly even opens up the avenue of maybe seeing if we can, maybe in the future, understand dolphins. But a certain point in the book does mention the fact that we may be able to get dolphins to maybe mimic human speech. I know that sounds crazy, but you're watching a brain spill video, so what did you really expect? To better understand his subjects, Lily decided to open the Communication Research Institute on the island of St. Thomas, where he and some colleagues pioneered the research into possible dolphin communication. In order to do this, however, he needed funding, and that is where NASA comes into it. They decided that this would be a fantastic use of their money and decided to invest in the project. Yes, maybe in the future we can talk with dolphins. Yes, money well spent. All you need is a little bit of faith. And also millions of dollars. During this time, a lady joined the team called Margaret Levette, who, uh, <laughs> let's just say that she was very hands-on with her work. That joke will be funny in about three minutes time. So, what was the study? Well, the scientists decided that it would be a good idea to make a dolphinarium, which essentially is a little bit like a house, but it was a place where the dolphins could stay. Two females and one male. The female dolphins were known as Sissy and Pamela, and the one male dolphin was named as Peter. Peter is the one that we're going to be focusing on today. Margaret's job was really just to spend time with the dolphins and to care for them while she was there, in order to try and build some sort of bond and relationship with them. I can just imagine this being like a small house which was left with the water running for some time from the bath and some dolphins decided to come squat in it. It was all very silly come to think of it. It all started swimmingly, where they decided to try and teach Peter how to f***ing speak. <laughs> what is this story? <laughs> In order to try and speed up the process and try and build that relationship between man and dolphin, Margaret decided it would be a good idea to move in with the dolphins, effectively living with the dolphins 24 hours a day in order to not only build up that trust and that relationship, but in addition to see if effectively this would help dolphins talk. Margaret even spoke about some of her observations from the time she spent with the dolphins and said the following. He was very, very interested in my anatomy. If I was sitting here and my legs were in the water, he would come up and look at the back of my knee for a long time. He wanted to know how that thing worked and I was so charmed by it. The team started running into a few issues, however, in particular with the dolphin Peter, mainly because of his age and the fact that he was just reaching sexual maturity. As far as dolphins go, he was just pretty horny all the time. The problem the researchers found was, just like any other prepubescent boy, he would get often distracted and not focusing on the actual learning that he was being given, which really, really hindered the research, and they decided that the only way to sort this was to try and give Peter conjugal visits with other dolphins, in order to satisfy his needs so he could get it out of his system and come back to learning. They only decided to do this because of the fact that Margaret was being harassed and bitten because she refused the dolphin's advances when she was living with Peter. So uh, yeah, it was probably a good idea they did that. Taking Peter to the other dolphins did apparently make him more receptive to their learning. Although the scientists soon feared that perhaps having him in close proximity with the other dolphins too much may mess up the experiment and we may never know if dolphins truly can speak. I mean, at the end of the day, the whole point of the research project was that dolphins needed to be able to communicate with humans. So you'd think 
that they'd want to try and get dolphin and human interaction as much as possible. It pains me to say the next part of this video, and I think some of you may know where I'm going with this. If I'm going to get demonetized in any video, it's probably this one. Right, so uh, what happened next? Was the decision that Margaret took to try and maintain the integrity of the experiment and decided whenever Peter needed to do the business, she would uh, get hands on in the experiment. Yeah, she would literally jerk off the dolphin. Anything in the name of science, I guess. As a matter of fact, Margaret commented on this as well and she said the following about the decision to do this. I allowed that. I wasn't uncomfortable with it. As long as it wasn't rough, it would just become part of what was going on, like an itch. Just get rid of it, scratch it off and move on. And that's how it seemed to work out. It wasn't private. People could observe it. It wasn't sexual on my part. Sensuous, perhaps. It seemed to me that it made the bond closer, not because of the sexual activity, but because of the lack of having to keep breaking. And that's really all it was. I was there to get to know Peter. That was part of Peter. You know what? The craziest part about this is that isn't even probably the weirdest part of this story, but we'll get there. So with that problem out the way, the scientists plowed on and carried on with their research to see if they truly could make a breakthrough with their communications with dolphins. And you may have thought what I said before was weird, but ladies and gentlemen, things are about to get a lot stranger in here. Let's just say that Dr. Lily did like to partake sometimes in the use of psychedelic drugs. And let's just say that he decided it might be a great idea to bring his love of psychedelic drugs into the research sphere. As a matter of fact, the reason that he was actually taking this apparently was that he was self-prescribing himself LSD and decided that if he gave the dolphins LSD in the research, they might become even more receptive to possibly communicating with humans. I don't know what world he was on when he thought of this, but the team decided it was a grand idea and they went ahead with it. So John, Lily and the dolphins start dropping acid and the two go on one strange acid trip together. As weird as this may sound, John Lilly actually reported that once the dolphins had taken LSD, they were becoming much more vocal in the noises they'd give each minute. And apparently he was able to make a measure of this to scientifically prove that LSD would make dolphins more talkative. John Lilly did try and explain that he was communicating with the dolphin, but it wasn't in the typical sense that you'd think. He said it was communication down to more things like physical touch, and nonsense vocalizations, which to me just sounds like nonsense, but apparently it's science. They will tell us when they don't want us in the pool. They will tell us when they do want us to come in. They do this by gestures, by nudging, stroking, and all sorts of this non-verbal, non-vocal language. It is a very primitive level, but it is absolutely necessary to make progress on other levels. Margaret did say that she wasn't really comfortable with the dolphins being forced to take LSD and the fact that she'd grown a bit of an attachment to them didn't really approve of it. However, that didn't stop our good doctor dropping acid with the dolphins and things progressed from there. However, things took a bit of a turn in 1970 when an article was published in Hustler magazine and they were describing what was happening in the research project Highlighting, of course, the more absurd parts of the experiment, which the scientists believe was overshadowing the true nature of what they were researching. But this captured the public's attention and a lot of negative press came their way. And really, for probably good reason, because if you saw a news article of a scientist who decided to give his dolphins acid, you'd wonder what the hell was going on in that laboratory. Although the scientists said that the article didn't go into the science of exactly what they were doing, that wasn't really their biggest concern. The biggest problem was the news managed to get back to NASA, the people who were funding this whole thing, and they weren't too happy to find out about all the shenanigans that had been going on. By this point, NASA had already plowed millions of dollars into the project and quickly pulled the plug when they found out what was going on. And it's safe to say that uh, all the shenanigans came to an end. That isn't the end of the story, however, because things go from bad to worse. 
With the plug being pulled and the project dead, the dolphins had to be moved to another facility. They were moved, but it was a much smaller pool they were in and there wasn't much natural lighting, which, as you can imagine, wasn't very good for the dolphins' mental health. And the really sad thing about this was the health of Peter the dolphin started to deteriorate once he was moved. And because the research project was over, Margaret didn't see the dolphins anymore. Imagine the dolphins having spent so much time with these people, Margaret in particular, and then not seeing her ever again. This all sadly came to an end where one day Peter had decided to swim to the bottom of the pool and just stop breathing. What was really weird about this was I had no idea that dolphins could even do this, which I guess you learn something new every day. Although this research project didn't yield the results that the team were looking for, it just goes to show how intelligent these creatures are. And as a direct result of this, legislation was soon passed which would look to give extra protections to these creatures, which is a nice silver lining to such a tragic end. If you liked the video, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want to be notified as soon as I upload my next video, be sure to hit the bell button. And if you've got any ideas as to what videos you'd like me to discuss next, let me know down in the comments below. As always, sources used in the video will be in the description. Right, well uh, I'm going to carry on doing research about mad experiments that happened in the 60s because I'm sure that is an absolute goldmine of content. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Fantastic.